I'm going to revisit the insert again today. And I'm going to explain the rationale of why I did it this way. Because as we talked about in class, <clears throat> uh, there, are, there could be easier ways to do an insert than this. But this insert was a little bit special for a couple reasons. First of all, the data came from places other than a form. So for example, uh, if I was simply entering in a new customer information where everything was entered on the form, there was a space for the name, email, city, state, zip, age, and so on. If everything is entered on a form, you can use a details view to do that. And we'll look at how you do that. Maybe not today, maybe today, maybe not today, I'm not sure. But in this case, the insert required us to get some of the data from, data, from fields on the form and some of the data from <coughs> other places. Uh, we were entering in announcements for a professor. And the professor ID we have because the person had logged in, right? And therefore, we had the, the data either in the query string or the session variable. So we did not need to enter that in, all right? So it would be dumb for us to have like a drop down where you got to select the person because then I could post an announcement for another professor, right? That wouldn't make sense. Since we know what the user ID is, we might as well just use that, all right? Because we have that on the query string and we have that on the, uh, on the um, what do I want to say, um, uh, query string. So, the other thing is the date and time. The date and time doesn't come from uh, an entry box. The date and time is just the current date and time. So we had some pieces of data that came from stuff that we entered on the screen. We had some pieces of data that the data came from other places. So rather than manipulating the details view to get it to do exactly what we wanted to do, it's just easier for us to write it ourselves, all right, I would say. Plus it's good to have sort of a variety of tools in your arsenal, all right. Uh, we've, we will see examples of using a details view to insert data. And, and we've seen this way. So we have two different ways. You can look at the situation and judge which way works best for you. So let's go and revisit that. And we got it working, but not working well. And let's remember where we were at with this. set this guy as the start page. So we're going to run this. And we'll see what we can do. can search for a professor, we can go to their details, and we can add a message in. Alright, title is Thursday, Thursday, 
is my Friday because I don't have class Friday. All right, I click save and can't really tell what happened, but it actually worked. All right, if I go to the database and viewed the data, we'll look at that table and we see we actually have that in the announcement table. Thursday is my new Friday. All right. I'm going to go delete these guys because they were they were just garbage test data I put in. Now, what we can do is we can make a couple improvements to this. And there's a couple improvements that I know we have to make. All right. Let's run down them and let's preview them. Uh, number one, we should show some indication that there was success. Right? Because the way it stands now, we hit submit and it succeeded. Right? But we didn't see anything on the page change. So it was very difficult for us to tell that it succeeded from the application. We need to somehow confirm that what we, what we thought we did actually worked. That's one thing we have to do. We have to eliminate, uh, uh, we have to do some validation also. Because if you remember, if we go in and try to enter something in here, and skip a field, we get a very ugly error. That looks like this. All right? Which is bad for a couple of reasons. All right? It's bad because uh, legit users aren't going to know what that means. I mean, they, they kind of have an idea what that means, but this is kind of an ugly error to show them. People that are potentially trying to exploit the system through SQL injection attacks, which I talked about before, this tells you a little bit of information about the database, that we have a table named announcement, all right, and that one of the fields is called announcement title. And you kind of don't want to give that information. Actually, if this was on a production environment, you would get a very generic error at this point. The .NET framework sort of allow uh, um, the .NET framework sort of by default keeps it so that you don't give too meaningful error message or too descriptive error messages to people that are potentially hacking. So we get this error message because we're in development mode. We'd never want to show this kind of error message to a person. But we could we could still do a way better job validating this, right? What do we want to validate? We want to validate for all the things that we can think of, and we want to validate for any other possible errors, even if we can't imagine what they are. All right? I know that sounds kind of, kind of funny, but we want to be able to handle errors that, uh, that we can't anticipate or we can't prevent through our code. For example, we saw uh, an instance of that last time when I had the table exclusively open within Access, all right, I went into Design View for the table, and that locked the table, so I couldn't do an insert into that table, all right. We want to prevent those kinds of errors from happening, all right. So we want to do a better job. We want to show the results. We want to do a better job of error trapping, and we want to lock this down so that I can't put announcements in for other professors. Right now, anyone can log in. You don't even have to log in. Let me rephrase that. Right now, anyone can go in and put in uh, an announcement for anyone. And that's not, not a good idea, right? Uh, so we're going we're gonna to lock down the security. So that will probably be what we do today. Um, all right. So first things first. Let's show um, the way that um, let's, um, how do I put this? Let's show that it worked by showing the results. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a grid view to this page, to the faculty info page. All right. I'm going 
going to have underneath the faculty information, I'm going to have a grid view that shows all the previously entered announcements. All right? And when they add one, that grid view will refresh. All right? Seems like a pretty good idea. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Keep in mind that I'm not doing a lot of formatting of this. You can do all kinds of styling to make your details view and grid views look better. But right now, I'm not really doing that. Okay, so let's go in <coughs> and let's add to this a grid view. I'm going to add the grid view there. Oh, I added... Did I add a grid view? Oh, yeah. It's just in the wrong place. And I'm going to add a SQL data source. Now, um, remember, I'm going to save this. Remember, we've been having the problem with uh, locking up when we go to configure the data source. All right? So I saved it, and we're going to try to configure the data source. But remember, we have an out, right? We can always go in and code the data source using the code view instead of using the GUI view. So it's a little bit harder, but it's good practice to know how to do that. So we'll go and we'll try to configure the data source. And if it doesn't work, if it freezes up, we'll then go in and we'll manually code the SQL data source. So I'm going to go in here, configure data source. What do I want? I want this connection string next. And it seems to be locked up. I was able to do this earlier in the semester. No problem, right? I mean, it might have locked up some of the time, but oh well. Let's... Exit out of here, and we'll use this as an opportunity to view how to do this in code, code mode. So we'll go here. Open this up. copy some of the stuff from the faculty data source. I'm going to call this SQL data source announcements. I'm going to copy the connection string over. line over if I can.
complaining about that, but we'll take care of that in a minute here because there's extra space. The connection string is the same. The provider is the name. Our select command is going to be select star from announcement. where faculty ID equals question mark. And we'll do order by announcement date DESC. What does DESC mean? Descending. So we're not going to have it from the earliest to the latest. We're going to have it from the latest to the oldest, which makes sense for announcements, right? The more recent announcements are probably more relevant than the older announcements, so we're going to show those at the top of the list. Let's make sure that this uh, select command works, and I'm going to take it and paste it into access. associate the grid view with this data set. So I'm going to say this data set gets populated from this data source. And I'm going to rearrange these things to put the grid view on top if I can. All right, that seemed to work. So now let's run it. save it in the database. Yeah, it did. In fact, it saved it twice in the database, once for each time. So something's wrong here. All right. My guess 
is that it's a timing issue. That grid view is refreshed before the insert to the database happens. All right? So in other words, if we're following through this, I go here, notice it's there. I type in new. Here is a new announcement. I click save. A whole series of events is going to happen, right? It's going to call the server back because that's what a submit button does. The server is going to refresh these components, okay? It's going to go and do the database queries again and pull the data, all right? Then it's going to do the insert. So that grid is always going to be a little bit behind because it's retrieving the data for that grid before it does the insert. So how can we handle that? All right. I don't expect you to know this. That was a rhetorical question. All right. How do you how uh, are, how can we handle that? We can handle that by writing code in a certain event on our page. All right. There's any number of events that happen that we can write code for in our C sharp C sharp code behind. All right. There's the on click method that handles what happens when we click on the button. There's a whole series of events that happen. All right, and we can write code on those to uh, control things and do things after they happen. I'm not 100% sure where I need to put this code. So I'm going to play around with some possibilities. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create an on click event on the save button. All right, here's the insert. What I want to do now is after the insert is done, I want to go and retrieve that grid view. So how do I refresh a grid view? Well, that seems like something I knew last semester, but don't remember this semester. So let's Google ASP.NET refresh grid view. How to refresh a grid view after it pressed a button. All right? It's almost like, you know, some of these things were like sitting out there waiting for me. And the answer is grid view dot data bind. So I can put in here. What's the name of my grid view? It's probably grid view one. Yeah, grid view one. I can simply say, hey, after I press, press the button, go and refresh the data. That's what data bind does. And I'm thinking this is going to work, not on wood. So we'll try this. And we'll see. So I go into my data, I type in click save and there we go. Okay? So, here's the idea. We're this is another case of the default behavior didn't work for us. Right? The default behavior was for the retrieval to happen after, or I'm sorry, before the button was clicked. So we can write our own code to do it the way that we want to. All right? So uh, it, it always bugs me, and I get this a few times a semester, when people say, well, that's what .NET did. .NET did it this way. .NET did it that way. You know, .NET isn't the programmer. .NET is a tool, you know. 
you wouldn't take a, a you know a, a table that a carpenter built and when you ask the carpenter why aren't the legs even say well that's how the saw cut the legs no you cut the legs you use the saw to cut the legs but you use the saw wrong if the legs aren't even same idea here we want that to refresh after now dot net's normal default behavior didn't work the way that we wanted it to initially but we can program it to work however way we want to so the other thing I want to do is I don't want to leave these populated with their old values so what else can I do after the insert <coughs> What else could I do after the insert? Set the text boxes to empty quotes. Yeah, set the add text boxes to empty strings. So I can say text box title dot text equals an empty string. And the other one is called what? Text box message. Here's sort of a, a, a pet peeve of mine, and I noticed this in this class, not, not you folks, I mean this class over the past so many semesters, um, that sometimes like in their project or in some of their assignments, they write something that is close to what was asked for, but it just completely logically doesn't make sense, sort of the flow. You still have to put your sort of user cap on and say, if I was a user accessing this page, does this flow make sense to me? All right? So therefore, little things like that. After I saved an announcement, gee, I don't want the text still on that announcement. All right? So, okay, I'll clear it out. That's a little thing that you can do that takes 30 seconds of your time, but really elevates your application to being much better than if you just do the bare bones and just follow the defaults that the, that the uh, .NET framework provides and so on. All right. So when you're running your application, look at it and say, does this make sense to me? If I was a professor entering in announcements, does this behave the way that I would expect to? And if it doesn't, it's not .NET's fault. It's your fault. And you need to go in and correct it and make it work the way that it's supposed to. Alright? This is what I was getting back before. The default behavior of .NET is great. In some cases it does a large number, a large percentage of what your total task is. But if it doesn't work, write it. Fix it. Make it work the way that you need it to work. Alright? So, especially on your project, you know, how many manuals are there for websites? There aren't manuals for websites. You go to a website, it's expected to be clear enough that just the average Joe in the street can go log on or not log on and do what they need to do without like being totally puzzled and totally confused. Sometimes it's good to show what you're doing to other people. All right? Does it make sense for this to work that way? All right? If not, change it. Okay, so, what's next? Sometimes have other people take a look at it. Again, I, I don't know if I mentioned that or not. That can be very useful. All right. I typed wrong. I should say message dot text. And this, I take it, will work the way that I want it to. So I'm going viewing Zellers on my announcements. I can type in. Thanksgiving, which is not too far away. It's scary, right? No class on Thanksgiving. 
I mentioned before, this is a technical class, right? The focus on this is writing different programming techniques and all that, but you still need to keep your designer hat on, I guess is a, is a lesson of this. You know, think, how would I want to see announcements? I probably would want to see them in reverse order, the most relevant one up front. All right? Okay, so we handled that. All right? Um, again, I could format this to look better. I'm not going to in the interest of time. Now, the next thing that we need to do is validation, right? Because this just isn't acceptable. Blowing up and giving us a big old ugly error message. All right? That's not acceptable. So we need to validate. Now, what kind of validation do we need here? It's actually pretty straightforward. We just need a validator for the uh, required field validator for the title and for the message. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm going to write the code here. I get this in this class a lot. I'll write, uh, I'll do some validation here. Use the controls, all right? Because the controls are tested. Um, you know, why reinvent the wheel? There's already a component that allows us to do a required field validation, so we might as well use it. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put two required field validators on here. One for that, one for that. For the first required field validator, I'll give an error message and say must enter title. For the second one, I have to say must enter message. Now, the other thing I have to do with any validator is I have to say what control we're validating. So in this case, we're validating title control, and in this case we're validating the message control. Um, I can definitely change the style of that. Probably the easiest way to change the style of that would be to go into your style sheet, create a class for error message, And color red, font, weight, bold, font size, 1.2M. Notice that I'm recognizing that there's some people that are colorblind that can't distinguish red. It will look like just a gray to them. So I'm not only using red to show that it's an error message. I'm also making it bold and making it a little bigger. All right. That way, um, if you're colorblind, you still get a different visual cue that, hey, there's something special about this. So I've made it stand out a different way. Um, so if you can distinguish the color red, then there's three things telling you that that's an error message. So you shouldn't miss it. Right? It's bigger. It's bold. And it's red. All right. Um, if, however, you are colorblind, it'll still be won't be red, but it will be bold and larger font. So now I go and do this. I come here, go to the details, and I get this error, right? which is an error I despise because this is totally on Microsoft Framework for changing the rules default between installations and so on. So what I need to do is I need to go and get that little snippet of code from one of my old projects.
see, when did we do that? I'm going to guess by this time of the semester we did it. By the way, what if you get an error like this? All right. If you get an error like this, you know, I happen to remember this one, and I know I have the code, and I know I have the code somewhere, so I'm just going to go and grab it. But if you were to get an error like this, and you didn't, you don't remember what, talking about this in class or whatever, Google the error verbatim. All right. It, it, you know, a lot of people know that, and if you do, good for you. There's a lot of people, though, that seem like puzzled by that magical technique, all right? Because you're probably not the first person in the world to have this problem, all right? And so, therefore, Google it, and... It'll tell you somewhere on the page... You might have to sift through it, <laughs> all right? You might have to sit, go through 20 pages of arguments and people calling each other noobs and being rude to each other and all that, but eventually you will find your answer, which in this case is this. I will put it um, in my web config file. I think it goes here. It doesn't. Nice thing to tell you that it doesn't go there. Alright. And we should be back on track. Okay. And we are. Oh, no, we're not at that page yet. Details. Yeah, we are. We hit this, we get our error message. Doesn't give us the error styling now. Why not? Forgot to tell it to. I defined the, the class, but I didn't associate the class with that label. So I need to go in here and say CSS class is... what I call it, error message. I'll do the same thing with that. I would rather do that via CSS than set these properties like the border color, back color, and all that. Because this way, when I do another form on this site, and I have validation, I can reuse that class instead of having to remember, gee, what did I set the color for, what I have to set the thing for, and all that. It's the same basic advantage of using CSS as opposed to putting the stuff in HTML. All right? So now we should be okay. Except for the kinds of problems that we can't expect. All right? And it's funny because it's hard to test these. Sometimes you have to rig the deck to test these. But if you remember from last time, we ran into a problem where the, the, the table is exclusively opened and we couldn't save it because the table is exclusively open. Let's recreate that error and let's, let's see, let's talk about what we can do and so on. So, we're going to run this. All right, I no longer get an error doing that. That's good. But what if I go in to the database and this is one of those things that you'll hear someone say, well, what are the odds that that could happen? 
Well, over a long enough time, the odds are pretty good that something weird is going to happen, right? So you might as well, to as great a degree as possible, sort of plan for unexpected things. And I know that sounds like a paradox, all right? How can you plan for something that's unexpected? You might not know exactly what's going to go wrong, but you can be pretty sure that something might go wrong, all right? I have a, uh, you know, I, my car is, is a 2006, right? And it has close to 200,000 miles on it, all right? Now, I don't know what's going to go wrong with it, but it's probably a safe bet something's going to go wrong with it within the next year, all right? Couldn't tell you for sure. I got some guesses, just like you might have some guesses, all right? But, yeah, if something going wrong, yeah, I'm probably going to need some repair over the next year. Same idea here. Well, here's one where we know that if we go in the design view for this, I'm not going to be able to write to the table while someone else is playing around in design view, which makes sense, right? What if they delete a column and I try to insert it or whatever? It's not good to allow people to insert data into a table while someone is playing around with the definition of the table. So, if I go and do this, where was I? All right, and I go to try to save an announcement that says, uh, Extra credit. What's that? All right. Now I go to save it. Something bad is happening, right? Because I tried to do an insert. It failed. And I'm back to an ugly air again. All right. So... <coughs> This is something we can't program to prevent, right? I can't program in my .NET framework uh, tools or whatever to say, hey, keep someone from editing this table in Access while I'm trying to save something. I can't write code to do that, right? So what's the other option? We have to be in a position to clean up the mess after it happens. All right, we have to be in a position to find the, that the error happened, and do something about it instead of just letting it blow up. All right? Because remember, someone's going to handle the error. The choices are you or the .NET framework, and you're not going to like the way the .NET framework does it. So therefore, you need to do that. So, how can we handle this kind of error? Yes? Wrap all that logic in a try-catch. Exactly. So what I'm going to do, and here's the nice thing. A try-catch you're all somewhat familiar with, right? So a try-catch block is going to look and try these statements if an exception is caught exception is caught, then I can do something with it. Alright? So, I'm going to put a label on the screen and we'll display some information in the label.
we can position it how we want to. And we can do something like this and say label three dot text equals, well, I can say insert exception dot to string. And that will give me um, just the rough description of the error that happened. All right. So now when we run this, to design view for the announcements. And I'm going to try to save. ugly message. Now, that's still a pretty ugly message, <laughs> right? All right, but here's the good news. We can write our own error message, all right, based on what we think could be going wrong here. Like, at this point, I've tested the insert statement. I've validated the data. So I know that that insert works, all right, and I'm validating the data. The only thing that could really go wrong is if there's something wrong on the database end. All right? Because I've handled everything I can handle. So if there's a problem, it must be on the database end. So I can display a message that says, um, likely cause database maintenance is being done. Try entering in a few minutes. All right? If this persists, contact the help desk if I was doing this like for a college, all right? That's a reasonable error message. It tells the user what happened, that your announcement was not saved, what the probable cause is, and what they need to do. So I'm going to go and I'm going to, instead of displaying this ugly error message, I'm going to display my own error message to say, announcement not added. Uh, what do I want to say? Um, likely cause database maintenance in process. Try again in a few minutes. Um, if this persists, contact the help desk. I could even do something like pop up a link, an email link to the help desk, if I wanted to be extravagant here. All right, so now when I go and run this, Announcement not add up. Likely cause database process, database maintenance in process. Try again in a few minutes. If this persists, contact the help desk. All right. A couple other things I want to do to this. If it makes it all the way through, 
without giving me grief, I want to blank out that error message. Because what if I try it again in 10 minutes? All right. Uh, and I want to give that label the error message class. Okay. So, now, should look even nicer.
on the page. And what's a panel? A panel is simply a block of, of uh, code that we can treat as a unit. Uh, you probably use panels in like your second assignment where I ask you to show and hide different stuff, like uh, the different topics. So if you pick the topic, show that topics panel, hide the other panels. All right. So probably, um, <coughs> probably uh, did that there. But we could do that here too. So I'm going to go in. I added my panel. I'm going to go and make sure all the stuff that I want in the panel is in the panel. So I'm going to put. panel up here. I'm going to call it panel entry. I'm going to copy this whole unordered list because that's my form and I'm going to pop it in here. All right. So now I got this panel called panel entry that I can show or I can hide. All right. So let's go in, and on the page load event, I'm going to check what? I'm going to check to see if they're logged in. We've already checked to see if they're logged in. How? We look to see if their full name is null. I'm going to copy this code. I'm going to do a slightly different test, though. I'm going to check to see if their faculty ID is null. So, is not null, then they're logged in. If they're not logged in, what do we want to do? Well, we definitely want to make that panel invisible. So panel entry dot visible equals false. All right. If the session ID, the session faculty ID matches Then, I'm going to make that panel entry visible. Otherwise, I'm going to make it invisible. So, I'll put some comments in here. Is someone logged in. If someone is logged in, are they visiting 
their own page. Someone is logged in and visiting their own page, which means that they can go and add new announcements. Otherwise, someone is logged in, but visiting someone else's page. And this is not logged in. You could simplify this code, right? I could initialize the visible to false and only set it true of that and make this if statement a lot smaller, but I wanted to show all the possibilities. Yes? Uh, for, for not logged in, it's, uh, would be a good practice to make uh, the text boxes read only just in case if your code reads compromised, uh, if they show that no one can still type anything in? Or, you know, anyone, anyone maliciously trying to hack in through that way? Well, let's look, let's, let's do this and view the source. All right? That's a good question. Let's go and view the source. All right, let's run this and make sure that it works, and then we'll view the source. I'm going to change the login page. I'm going to set the login page as a start page, and I'm going to change the login page that after they log in, I get redirected to the faculty info page. So, I run this. I'm not logged in. I go to the faculty info page. I can see the announcements, and I don't see those at all. All right? But to your point, are they there and just set to invisible? I think is what you're asking. If I look at this and do a view source, there's the announcements. It's not even like they're there. Okay? So you don't have to really like make them read only. All right, because they're not even seeing there. The only way they'll they appear is if the if the system was compromised and they logged in as the faculty person. And if they did, there's really nothing we can do to distinguish that from a legitimate login. Okay, so if it's not logged in, it works. So if we go here without logging in. We can read their information, but we can't edit it. <coughs> if I log in, because it's expecting something on the query string. Well, we can fix that. I can form this ID to equal faculty ID plus should go and test to make sure that that ad works, right? Because I monkeyed around with the code. I will tell you, the one expression 
that I heard as a programmer more than any other sentence, even more than what's for lunch, all right, or let's have pizza, was all I changed was this one line of code. I couldn't possibly have broken it, all right? Guess what? You might have broken it. It's very difficult the way that code is connected sometimes for you to be absolutely sure that a change that you made in one place doesn't affect something else. Therefore, test it. Make sure. Gee, does the validation still work? Yes, it does. Does it work if I enter in a brand new message? Yes, it does. Now I know that it works, all right? At least to a greater degree. So, if you think even something simple as this, think of all the test cases we have. Can someone that's not logged in enter data? Can the wrong person enter data? Can the right person still enter data? All right? Let's go and see if I can enter an announcement for Doug. Because I'm logged in as Mike Zellers. What if I search for Huber and go to his page? Ah, I don't have the entry screen. All right, so I can't enter an announcement for him. So this more or less works the way that I set it out to. All right? And again, it worked by me custom coding certain pieces of it to treat the objects on the page the way that I wanted them treated to achieve the task that I was trying to do. All right? This isn't out-of-the-box behavior, in other words. This is me writing code that um, doesn't do everything. I still use the framework's capabilities. I still use the framework's uh, objects for uh, a data source and for validation controls and all that. But I write little pieces of code that glues the components together and treats them the way that I want to, to make the flow of it work. Any questions over any of this? Okay. Um, that's all I had for today. I will go unlock the lab. I'll be back here to get my files. Then I'll be back in lab.